I'm going to start off this episode by saying this. I went into this story truly believing that there was some kind of conclusion or at least something that resembled closure. And I realized after going through over 52 separate resources and spending tens of hours literally researching this case that I would be sorely disappointed. There are so many moving pieces to this case, so many questions, and so few real answers. I found myself getting mad. I felt my heart break and above all felt frustration as I learned about all of the details. I watched as this family tried everything that they could to put this case in the spotlight. So I decided that if anything, it was important to talk about and important to keep it in the spotlight because it's likely you may not even know about this case. I didn't. It wasn't until somebody mentioned it to me that I found myself looking into it and wondering, what the hell? The bottom line is, I'll give you all of the information that I've learned and let you judge for yourself. Today, as it stands, this case is closed with the cause formally being called accidental. But like most things in life, not everything is as it seems. Also, a lot of the information in this case involves high school students. And as such, in any documentation, their names have been redacted, which makes it really difficult to know who's who. So at times I'll use fake names, but I'll let you know when this actually occurs. And lastly, before we begin, there are so many resources for this podcast. It's impossible to rattle them all off here. So what I will do is have a link to a Google document that contains everything that I used, including links to the official reports on Scribd, if you're interested in reading those, and you will find all of those on my profile link within Instagram. Some students discovered Kendrick's body in the middle of a gym class at Lowndes High School in Southern Georgia. He was found head first inside a rolled up wrestling mat. The only thing visible was his feet, which only had socks on and a pair of shoes dumped on top. He wasn't moving. This discovery would set off a multi-year investigation that included allegations of cover-ups, a rogue FBI agent, and local judges too afraid to tackle lawsuits resulting from Kendrick's death. Welcome to the Beach House 34 True Crime Podcast. I'm your host, Christine Worth. The last conversation, 17-year-old Kendrick Johnson, a sophomore at Lowndes High School in Georgia, had with his dad, was on a Wednesday, just a couple of days before Kendrick's body was found. Kendrick, known as KJ, knew his dad, a truck driver, was going to buy a new truck. And he was curious if he had bought it yet, so he called his dad who said that he'd be back Saturday morning and see him then. That never happened. One day later, on Thursday, Kendrick's mom, Jackie, arrived home after work and realized that her son Kendrick wasn't home. Jackie, a school bus driver herself, then called and spoke with the driver of the number 34 bus, the bus that Kendrick takes to school, and found out that Kendrick hadn't ridden the bus home. So she thought he may have stayed for the basketball game that was happening at school later that day. Jackie then spoke to Kendrick's sister and she hadn't heard from Kendrick either, so she didn't know what he was doing. 
Jackie then called her husband and asked if he had heard from him because Kendrick normally calls when he gets home. He too had not heard from Kendrick. So Jackie and Kendrick's sister then got into the car and returned to the school to look for him, but they couldn't find him. After waiting a few hours, and with the basketball game well over by this time, there was still no Kendrick. Jackie was worried. She again called her husband, and he told her to call 911 because, quote, something wasn't right. Sergeant Roby arrived at the Johnsons after Jackie had called 911, and Jackie told him that Kendrick was supposed to be home by 10 p.m. on a school night. Quote, not 10.01, not 10.02, at 10 o'clock. Her children know better. The officer asked her to describe KJ and what he was wearing, and she said it was a white shirt, jeans, and white tennis shoes. Sergeant Roby then said that he'd ride around the school and the area to see if he could see him anywhere. Jackie, too, got into her car and headed back out to the school, the last place that Kendrick was supposed to be. By this time, it was around midnight. Jackie called her husband, and he became so worried that he had to pull over his semi and lay down. He already knew, deep down in his heart, that Kendrick was gone. When Jackie didn't have any luck locating Kendrick, she headed back home, but she couldn't sleep. Early the following day, she again called her husband to let him know what was going on, that she hadn't heard from Kendrick and she wasn't sure what her next steps should be. He suggested that she head to the school. So first thing in the morning, Jackie headed to Lowndes High School to see if anyone had seen Kendrick. There was no record of Kendrick being at school that day. At 10.32 that same morning, an officer received a call about a code blue at Lowndes High School. According to the dispatcher, someone had found a body in what they call the old gym. There are several gyms on the campus of this high school, and this was just the name of one particular gym. They always refer to it as the old gym. When the officer arrived at the school around 11.08 that morning, approximately 30 minutes after the phone call, a group of school resource officers were there waiting for him to guide him to where he needed to go. As he approached the gym, several students passed him in an apparent hurry, and he overheard some of them saying, that was a dead body. As the officer approached the gym, he was taken to a location inside the gym where a stack of wrestling mats stood in the corner next to the bleachers and a group of school officials were also there as well. The responding officer then called the captain of the Lowndes Police Department and asked her to come to his location. As he approached the mats, he could distinctly smell what he described as the odor of a dead body. One of the adults standing near the mats was the coach who had been teaching a class when the body was found. The officer learned that the coach, who'd been in the middle of class, when one of his students called him over to the mats because they thought they had found a body inside of one of them. With the help of some students, the coach moved many of the wrestling mats out of the way so they could get to the one where the body was located. Now, I think it's important to point out what this scene looked like, because when I was researching this, I was having difficulty figuring out exactly how the mats were stacked and positioned and where the bleachers actually came into play. When you first walk into the gym, you enter at one end of the court. It's your typical, ordinary high school gym. The first thing you see is obviously the court with basketball hoops on each end. If you look to the left, you see a set of aluminum bleachers running along one side. At the end of those bleachers, in the far corner of the gym, are at least 
20 wrestling mats, and they were all standing on end, upright, and each mat was bound with a strap. When the coach got to the mat where the body had been found, he tipped over the mat and then tried to get the boy out. When he finally did, he realized that the young man was already gone. Inside the mat was a young male who wore jeans and socks, but no shoes. His face was severely disfigured and swollen. The officer noted that, quote, the only identifying feature of the victim was his long dreadlocks, unquote. Not long after the first officer arrived, three firefighters came into the gym and began to take over. One of the paramedics stated that, quote, rigor has already set in. There was nothing they could do to save the boy. As I had mentioned before, and I just want to make this very clear, the body had been positioned head first inside this rolled up wrestling mat. So within minutes, the entire gym became an active crime scene. Two additional detectives were already on their way to the high school to get more information about the missing person that had been reported the night before, Kendrick Johnson. They were on their way when they heard the call that there was an unresponsive person located in the old gym at the high school. So they continued on to the school to help. More police and other agencies began to arrive. And eventually there were nine members of the Lowndes County Sheriff's Office inside this gym, along with two members from the Valdosta Lowndes Regional Crime Laboratory, two criminologists, and six members from the Georgia Bureau of Investigations. And if you feel like that's a ton of people at one location, you would be right. The coach and the students who had initially found the body were waiting in a classroom to be questioned. Now, one of the officers first went to speak with the coach. It was learned that the coach had been teaching a class when two students, who happened to be sisters, decided that they wanted to go lay down on top of the mats. After they were there for a few minutes, one of them noticed what looked like feet with socks on them inside a mat. She thought it was some kind of joke, so she then called for a friend of hers to come over and take a look. The friend climbed up the bleachers, and when he got to the top, he went to the mat that the girl was pointing out. When he looked down, he saw what he thought was a person inside because he too saw what looked like feet with socks on them. They then called the coach over, and when he realized that something was wrong, he tried to first pull the person out from the top of the mat, but they wouldn't budge. The coach and a student then moved other mats out of the way so that they could get to the mat the person was inside of. Once the coach reached the mat he was looking for, he quickly realized that the person inside the mat was deceased. Now, while speaking was difficult, he had all of the children leave the gym area and go to a classroom. He couldn't remember who called 911, but knows that someone did. I want to add something here that the two girls that found the body were both daughters of the school superintendent, Wes Taylor. As the investigation continued, they found one black and white Adidas shoe on the floor in front of the rolled up mats that was now lying on the ground. So it was likely due to it being moved by the coach and the students. A yellow two pocket folder was also lying on the ground near the mats, which contained schoolwork from Kendrick. Blood stains were found on one wall of the gym, and after testing, these did come back positive for blood, but we later found out that it was not Kendrick's blood. But that's all we know. They didn't test the blood for anyone else other than Kendrick. Doesn't make any sense to me. The high school thankfully had a reasonably large video security system in the area of the old gym where Kendrick was located. There were about 
40 cameras. And I don't mean that there were 40 cameras actually inside the gym. Within the area of the old gym, there were about 40 cameras. Within the gym itself, there were four. One of the detectives then met with the head of the school's IT department to have the last 48 hours of the footage for that entire wing, so all of these 40 cameras, pulled. Now, because of the scope of the project, it was going to take a few days to get the footage that the police needed. According to a police report, it wasn't until around 4 o'clock that afternoon that the Lowndes County Coroner, Bill Watson, arrived to do the examination of Kendrick. Now, keep in mind, Kendrick was first discovered around 10.30 in the morning. The officers arrived at 11.08, and shortly after this, the EMTs arrived. So at best, we're looking at a four and a half hour difference from the time Kendrick was found until the coroner arrived to do an examination. State law requires immediate notification. The coroner later stated in a recorded interview with CNN that in his opinion, the scene had been compromised because the body had been moved. Lieutenant Stride Jones of the Lowndes County Sheriff's Department in the same CNN interview explained this long time period of the coroner coming to the place Explain this away, saying that, quote, it was a very time consuming process to get from the outside in. Once our investigators got to the body, we contacted the coroner. Now, just think about this for a minute. We know, we know that this statement is not true. The coach from the school had already moved the mats away with the help of another student, right? Why would they lie about it taking them so long? to move the mats when the mat that Kendrick was in had already been accessed and laid down so that the coach could check on him in the first place. Later on, we found out that the coroner sent an email to CNN, and this is evidently prior to this interview, that said, quote, I would appreciate it if you would destroy this interview with me. I do not want this to be shown whatsoever. I feel that our situation should not be be aired. Now back inside the gym, inside the mat, they found a pair of black, gray, and orange tennis shoes. Another pair of shoes were found near the bleachers, which appeared to have blood on them. But after someone, whoever was there, determined that the substance didn't appear to be blood, they didn't even take the shoes into custody for evidence. Now, after they placed Kendrick on a sterile white sheet to do a further examination, they located the other black and white tennis shoe that matched the first one they had found. If you remember, this was the Adidas shoe. In regards to Kendrick himself, his face was swollen and he had blood coming from his eyes, his nose, and his mouth. They also found blood on his arms and on his chest. The actual investigation uh, at the old gym ended around 5.30 that afternoon, and uh, Kendrick was then transported to the Lowndes Crime Laboratory. Kendrick's dad phoned in from the road and asked one of the officers what had happened. All that she would tell him was that something was on Kendrick's head. That's all she would say. And your thoughts are probably like mine. What the hell did that mean? On his head, something was on his head. In the meantime, Kendrick's mom is at the school. And after, of course, after learning that a body had been found inside the old gym, and although there wasn't any confirmation that it was Kendrick, she just knew that it was her son. She is visibly upset. She's screaming in the hallway. And school is just going on as usual. Students are moving from class to class, and any potential evidence is being trampled over. They didn't allow Jackie, Kendrick's mom, to identify him inside the gym. Instead, what they did was they showed Kendrick's sister a picture of a shoe 
that was found near Kendrick and asked her if it was his. She said that she thought that it was. The same day, the sheriff informed the family that there wasn't any evidence of foul play. How could they have possibly made that determination by that point? Seriously. So let's back up here just a little bit. So Thursday, the 10th, was the day that Kendrick went missing. He was last seen on camera heading into the old gym at 1.09 p.m. that day. And don't worry, we'll get to the camera videos really soon. But something stuck with me. He never showed up for his class or his next class that day on Thursday and for the rest of the school day. The following day, on Friday, he was marked as absent. And as we now know, this is the day that his body was found. Why didn't the school then notify his parents, especially if he was absent for the rest of the day on Thursday and then again the next morning? You know, maybe they did, but I have never found this piece of information anywhere. So let's get back to Kendrick. And uh, I want to apologize because during this entire thing, sometimes I'll refer to him as KJ and sometimes as Kendrick, but please just know that they are one and the same person. But to put this whole situation into perspective, uh, KJ was five foot 10 and the wrestling mat that he was found inside of was six feet long or tall, depending on how you're viewing the mat itself. KJ's shoulders, his shoulder width, was measured at 19 inches. Now, the opening of the mat, according to police records, was 14 inches. Now, how would KJ, as one theory by the police, was that he just fell into these mats? How would this be possible? Another theory was that he had dropped a shoe and was reaching down to retrieve it. And if this was the case, he would have had to purposefully wiggle down the inside of the mat just to get the one shoe, simply because his shoulders are far wider than the opening of the mat. And remember, the mats were secured with a band around the outside. So it wasn't like he could just shimmy down inside the mat while the exterior of the mat got looser and looser. Plus, if you had to work that hard to get just one shoe, it would be easier to just move the mat and pick it up, which according to interviews with other students is exactly what they typically did. It was common to throw shoes near the mats. Now, one explanation I read was that they threw them inside the mats. And another explanation was that they threw them in the back corner of where the mats were. And they did this so that they could grab them later. They would just then move a mat or two out of the way and grab their shoes. Now, when you consider that it would have been nearly impossible for Kendrick to fit himself inside of the mat or laughably fall into the mat or even kind of shimmy down into it to get a shoe, then you're left with another and more likely scenario that he had been rolled up in the mat and placed there. It's actually one of the more logical explanations as to how KJ ended up where he did. To make this even more strange, when he was found, his second pair of shoes, the gray and the orange ones that I had mentioned earlier, they were laying right next to his legs inside the mat at the top, as if they had been tossed in on top of him. And remember, he was only found wearing socks. So did someone put him there, put Kendrick there, remove his shoes and then toss the shoes inside. Maybe someone didn't want him found. And with KJ's shoes on, they stuck out of the top of the mat, making him visible. So they took his shoes off and tossed them inside. After KJ was taken from the mat, there was a pool of blood where his head had been. But, and this is a big, big but, the shoe that police said that Kendrick was after. Remember, this was supposed to be at the bottom of the mat. 
The shoe, however, was totally clean. If this shoe were supposed to have been underneath Kendrick, and remember, Kendrick was found to be bleeding in several places, it would have been saturated with blood, right? Now, keep in mind, I am only speculating here on what I personally think just from viewing the crime scene photos and reading all of this information. Now, along with this random shoe that, remember, there was a random shoe that appeared to have blood on it that was not taken in as evidence, there was also a hoodie that was found that was not KJ's and also looked like it had blood stains on it. This too was not tested by the crime lab. The blood stains that were on the wall of the gym, they did have little small samples taken of them. And just so you know, these blood stains, they were not just small dots or uh, little specks of blood. These, these were large dried drips of blood. Now, as I mentioned before, they did take samples of this and test it to see if it was blood. Um, they found out that, yes, this was true. It wasn't Kendrick's. And so they left it at that. Lieutenant Stride said that they didn't know whose blood it was, but that it didn't appear to be related to their crime in any way. So how do they know that it's unrelated if they don't even know who the blood belongs to? Before Kendrick's body was found, around one o'clock, um, two officers were actually asked to respond to a location in regards to an assault that had happened. Now the person's name was redacted because they were still a minor. Um, but this person uh, was assaulted because he had possible contact with Kendrick. And remember, this is prior to Kendrick being found. At this point, you know, Kendrick is still just missing. So the person who had been attacked uh, had review refused medical attention and the officers waited for this person's mother to show up. When she did, she was told that this child would be taken to the sheriff's office to discuss this incident and what it had to do with Kendrick. His mother said, sure, you can go ahead and talk with him. And all of this just kind of makes you wonder who knew what before Kendrick was even found, doesn't it? So at 2.30 that afternoon, now remember, by this time, Kendrick has been found. Um, at 2.30 this after that afternoon, two minors actually walked into the sheriff's office to report some Facebook posts by a particular individual. And again, this is another minor. This post said, post said something to the effect of, quote, when you start messing, the goons bodies start showing up, unquote. Now, the young female who had reported the post said that this guy uh, deactivated his account not long after he had made this post. Before he did this, though, two others made comments that this person was going to start killing them, whoever them are, off one by one. Now, this female, she explained that Kendrick and several of his friends were part of a group called CVC, uh, which stands for the Clatville Click. The person that she was reporting to the police had been fighting with this group because one of its members had been messing with someone's girlfriend. So, you know, all very teenage stuff. Later on at the police station, uh, while the police are speaking with the with this young man who had been assaulted, and remember, we're back to, to this, this young man gave his explanation. Uh, he heard that someone had been found dead at the high school and he was being blamed for it. He said, quote, I guess KJ, that was why his sister came with them to try and get me. He didn't know why he would have been blamed for Kendrick's death. He was then asked if he had posted anything on Facebook recently that would make people think that he had problems with KJ. So at this point, we know that this person who was assaulted was likely the one who made the Facebook posts. He continued on to say that he didn't have a Facebook page, which I guess was technically true. He didn't. He had deleted it but he didn't mention this. 
He then continued to say that he hadn't posted on Facebook in about two to three days. But remember, he didn't have a Facebook page, right? The other thing that kind of caught my attention here is that in this young man's explanation to the police, and he's saying, hey, he was being blamed for Kendrick's death. And that was why the assault occurred. But remember, this assault happened prior to Kendrick being found inside the gym. So that leaves all kinds of questions, right? Now, according to the Johnsons, Kendrick's parents, um, throughout that day, they still hadn't been able or allowed to identify their son. Uh, of course, they found him at the gym. The, they did all of the processing. They had taken him, taken Kendrick to the crime lab. Um, the only identification that had been done so far was showing Kendrick's sister a photo of his shoe and asking if it was his. So the family, they held this rally and demanded that one of his parents be allowed to view Kendrick and actually officially identify him. The fact that they would have to do this at all is just unbelievable. So an hour and a half after the rally, KJ's dad received a phone call inviting him down to the crime lab to identify his son. When KJ's dad went in to identify his child, the first thing that he noticed was that the room, he felt that the room was very warm. Uh, he just chalked it up to him being nervous. When he approached the drawer where his son was contained and they pulled it out, he said that he felt a rush of warm air and he was confused because he thought that it was supposed to be cool air and he would be correct. Um, the person showing uh, Kendrick's dad, his body, then unzipped this bag all the way down to his feet. And he knew right away that it was Kendrick. He also noticed that one side of Kendrick's face appeared to be swollen as if he'd been hit. KJ also still had his arm up and around his head. This is like as if you were laying down and you just casually put one of your arms over your head. His arm wasn't obscuring his face, but more resting across the top of his head. And if you wish to, you can view these photos, um, especially the ones of his face online. Uh, they are very graphic, I'll forewarn you, but they're also very telling. The main detective handling the case of Kendrick uh, Winningham, along with Lieutenant Jones, uh, met with Kendrick's mom and his sister. They gave an update onto what they had found and told them that there were no signs of trauma to Kendrick's body. He would, however, be sent to the crime lab for an autopsy. But according to the official Valdosta Lowndes Regional Crime Laboratory Report, which you can actually read online at scribd.com, it states that, quote, Johnson's face was swollen and had blood exiting from his eyes, nose and mouth. There was visible dried blood on Johnson's arms, chest, and face. Johnson's eyes were swollen, fixed, and dilated. There appeared to be no signs of blunt force trauma on Johnson's face or body. There appeared to be no visible signs of wounds to Johnson's body. Unquote. We'll find out later that according to additional pathologist, pathologists, uh, plural, this simply was not true. The autopsy that was performed by the GBI or Georgia Bureau of Investigation found that Kendrick had died from what they referred to as positional asphyxia. Now, what this means is that he suffocated due to the position of his body. According to Wikipedia, quote, people may die from positional asphyxia accidentally when the mouth and nose are blocked or when the chest may be able, unable to fully expand, unquote. Four days after Kendrick was found on January 15th, Kendrick's family retained an attorney and filed a lawsuit saying that they were absolutely sure that Kendrick's death was not an accident. Their attorneys were focused actually on two brothers. Um, they were called the Bell brothers. One of them was in Kendrick's grade 
and the other was older. These brothers also happened to be the sons of a local FBI agent. The brothers, it's important to note, are members of the Lowndes High School wrestling team. The family says that these boys weren't even on campus the last time that Kendrick was seen alive. And the reason they believe that the reason the Johnsons believe that one or both of the boys were involved with uh, this incident or the death of Kendrick was that a year before Kendrick and the younger of the Bell brothers had been in a fight on a school bus. Now the day of the school bus fight, Kendrick, one of Kendrick's friends and Brian Bell were on a school bus heading to a playoff football game. And according to one of KJ's friends who was on the bus that day and happened to be in the seat directly in front of KJ and Brian, uh, said that Brian was just being the way that he was. He was messing around and playing, but when Brian played, he played rough like a bully. Brian and KJ were actually sitting together in the back seat of the bus when Brian pulled KJ's dreads and pulled them down. So he's like yanking his head down in the back of the bus. When KJ got up, they started to fight. So KJ evidently got the best of Brian and Brian didn't like that. At some point, the bus stopped and KJ got off the bus and was led to a police car while Brian was able to sit in the stands at the football game and continue on sit in the stands with his parents. When police heard about this confrontation between the two, uh, they went to question this student. So they went to go question Brian. When the officers called Brian's dad to request an interview, they were referred to their attorney, to the Bell's attorney. Now, every child in that school that the police had wanted to interview was given permission by their parents to speak with the police, all but the Bell brothers. Now, after this fight on the bus had happened, a KJ told his mom all about it. And a few days later, he told his dad that Brian's older brother, Brendan, kept staring at KJ and KJ had heard that Brendan had been telling other kids that, quote, it ain't over. But KJ told his dad, quote, he wasn't worried. According to his dad, uh, KJ told him that Brian and Brendan's dad, whose name is Rick, confronted KJ and told him that the fight on the bus, it wasn't a fair fight and he should come over to their house and fight Brian. KJ's dad then asked what he said to this guy. And KJ says, quote, I looked at him like he was crazy and turned around and walked off. Now, KJ's friend, uh, the one that had been on the bus with KJ that day, then said that after Kendrick had been found, all of a sudden, Brian, who used to walk by or even hang out with all of them at a certain spot in school uh, during classes, he would all of a sudden start to take a different route. He no longer walked by the group. KJ's friend wondered why and then started to put the pieces together thinking that maybe it was Brian who had actually killed KJ. In the meantime, the Johnsons, they're doing everything they can to keep Kendrick's story in the spotlight. The Johnsons, they would hold rallies at the corners of the Lowndes County Courthouse, no matter the weather, they were there demanding justice for their son. They would even often walk 17 miles to Valdosta, Georgia to symbolize the 17 years of KJ's life. At one point, KJ's parents, along with others, locked arms and held fast in front of the courthouse, not letting anyone inside. And the reason for their protest was because they had not been given any information about KJ or his case. It wasn't long before others got involved in the case to help the Johnsons. The FBI got involved, as did Reverend Floyd Rose, who was president of the Valdosta Lowndes County chapter of the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and Lee Touchton lead investigator for the SCLC and former president of the local NAACP. The Johnsons, 
then filed a lawsuit alleging that the FBI agent, so the dad of the two children, quote unquote, encouraged his two sons to attack Kendrick with the help of three other people, one of them being a female who induced Kendrick to enter the gym where he was then met by the two brothers and another student who fatally beat Kendrick and then placed him in the gym mat. The police contend that at least one of the brothers wasn't even on campus when Kendrick was last seen and the other one was in another part of the building. On the 16th of January, uh, the IT department of the high school provided detectives with the surveillance video that the police had requested. More interviews by the police were conducted on the 17th. And again, a lot of these names are redacted because at the time they were minors. Uh, but one of the uh, people interviewed uh, was a young male and he told officers that he and Kendrick often shared shoes and they would hide them in the wrestling mats in the old gym. You know, both pairs of shoes the black and white pair as well as the gray and orange pair were Kendrick's. Another student backed up this statement saying that it was very common that Kendrick as well as other kids would throw their shoes over the mats in the corner so that they could get them the next day. Kendrick's funeral and his burial was held on January 19th of 2013. A full month later, on February 11th, the detective in charge of Kendrick's case handed over some swabs that had been recovered from the incident so they could be sent to the crime lab. I wish I knew why this took an entire month, but I don't. A judge, it was later discovered, decided that based on the theory, the theory, not the facts of what had happened, said that Kendrick's death was accidental. Now, later on, we'll meet another homicide uh, detective who actually uh, got this case after many other things happened, and we'll meet him later. But it's important to bring him up now because uh, during a documentary, he said that in his entire 23-year career as a homicide detective, he had never heard a judge make a ruling based on a theory it should be facts, only facts. If a doctor believes the death is undetermined, then that would at least leave the case open. Now, sometimes these cases of undetermined deaths, they can be open for years. But once a judge rules that it was accidental, all investigation then stops. In June of that same year, Jackie Johnson, Kendrick's mom, requested that a second autopsy be done. Now, Kendrick, remember, had been buried nearly four months earlier, meaning that his body would then need to be exhumed. They had his body exhumed and flown to Florida to be examined by a Dr. Bill Anderson. Now, Dr. Anderson had been working in pathology for over 40 years. He had read the state's report about Kendrick and saw that the lungs were normal weight. And the reason that this is important to remember, they had determined that Kendrick had died of positional asphyxia. So, you know, he suffocated essentially. If he actually had died from asphyxia, um, the lungs would have actually been much heavier than what they were because it's a normal process for the lungs to begin to fill with fluid if a person cannot breathe. This was the first sign to Dr. Anderson that something really wasn't quite right. Now, when Dr. Anderson received KJ's body and began his autopsy, he found that the body was stuffed with newspapers and there were no organs at all. Everything from the top of his head to his pelvis was gone. During normal autopsies, the organs, they're taken out, they're weighed, they're examined, and then they're placed into a plastic bag, which is then put back into the body. Therefore, because they weren't there, 
there was no way that Dr. Anderson could examine KJ's lungs. The GBI, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, said that after the autopsy, all the body parts were there and they were released to the funeral home. The funeral home, however, said that when they received the body, these organs were not there. So since Dr. Anderson uh, couldn't work with actual organs, uh, what he could work with was the rest of the body. So around KJ's face, uh, he did find extensive bleeding on one side. It was near the carotid sinus, and I hope I said that right, which is a major vein that controls blood pressure. And what this vein does is it's on the side of your neck and it supplies blood from the heart to the brain and it gives the brain freshly oxygenated blood. If the blood pressure goes too high, the body senses this and then slows the heart rate. Now, one way that the heart could be slowed is by compressing around the area of this carotid sinus, resulting in people dying suddenly. Now, I had to take a step back for a second when I read this and do a little bit of research on what would cause a carotid sinus obstruction. How would this happen? Come to find out this would happen if someone had restricted this area of his neck by using a choke hold. Now, while many groups do use this type of hold as a form of submission, in, as a matter of fact, in judo, it's called a strangle hold or strangles. And in law enforcement, they're referred to as, quote, neck holds. Now, remember, I'm just offering my own opinion here. But if this is how Kendrick died, it seems very suspicious to me that A, any one of the brothers that were being blamed were raised by an FBI agent who likely had this kind of training about neck holds and was able to teach his kids, or B, since they were wrestlers, they no doubt knew what a chokehold was. And while it's illegal to use in high school sports, it doesn't mean that they weren't aware of what it was. Now, finally, I'll just say this. I find it suspicious that Kendrick was found inside of a wrestling mat when he had been fighting with wrestlers. Just my opinion. According to Dr. Anderson, uh, this area of Kendrick's neck had a significant amount of damage as compared to the other areas of his neck, which led Dr. Anderson to believe that Kendrick had suffered from blunt force trauma. And according to the doctor, this is a far more reasonable explanation as to why Kendrick died and with why the lungs would not have had any fluid. He didn't find that the death of Kendrick was consistent with positional asphyxia. As a matter of fact, the initial report that was done on KJ noted that there was significant bruising to the right side of his jaw. The doctor also said, Quote, I'm not sure at this point who did not return the organs to the body, but I know that when we got the body, the organs were not there. And that, my friends, is the end of part one of the Kendrick Johnson story. And part two, which is equally as long, which is why I broke this up into two separate parts, we will get into the videos of uh, what they found in regards to the newspapers. We'll get into a third autopsy and we'll find out what happened with this FBI agent. So stay tuned. <laughs>